Welcome to worship and happy Sabbath. I'm so glad you've joined us today. I don't know what kind of a week you've had, but I do know this, by coming together and fellowshipping together, even if it's online, it binds us together in the Spirit of God. And I pray a blessing. Today we're going to wrap up our sermon series on end time thinking. And we're coming to that last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. May you right now just block out everything that happened this past week. May there be quiet and peace in the place that you are. And as we worship, as we praise, as we pray, and as we study, may you be blessed. God has a special blessing for each of us today, and we claim that by faith. Nothing worth more I could ever come close Nothing can compare You're our living hope Your presence, Lord I've tasted and seen the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord
Join me now as we go to the foot of God's throne of grace in prayer. Lord, no human government will ever be like yours. You rule in majesty and power, yet within your unapproachable light you care tenderly for us and manifest a spirit of humility, gentle kindness, and magnanimity. We are grateful to you for times of peace, wellness, and prosperity, and we look to you for mercy and help when we are challenged. You are our King and Jesus, our Prince. You are our peace, and only in you will we find unity and rest from striving and controversy. Lord, these have been times of concern for us, and many of us have been touched by an epidemic that disables and kills indiscriminately and that spreads stealthily. Please bring healing and relief. We pray that you would give wisdom to our leaders, to the healthcare professionals and frontline workers of our communities, and help us be conscientious and caring towards our neighbors. Please comfort the families who have lost loved ones and give healing and strength to those who are struggling with illness. We ask that you would bring better times and help those who are out of work to return to productive and gainful employment. Please give us hope in a future. Our highest hope is that you will live in us through your Holy Spirit and let us be the comfort and strength that you would have us be on this earth. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. And let us be ministers of reconciliation in your name. Please forgive us our faults and our failures and remind us to pick up from our losses. Heal our self-imposed hurts and go on in courage, trusting not in ourselves, but in you. We ask you all these things in Jesus' precious name. We thank you, Father. Amen. I've been reflecting this week, church, on how different the world is today than when uh, Rose and I moved to Visalia in 2015. I mean, so much has happened. Um, you know, so much has changed over these past five years. M maybe today you could find a few minutes to do your own reflection on how your world has changed over the past five years. There's been so much happen. And day by day and week by week, we all are fighting the challenges of life. We're, we're, we're struggling to get through. We're struggling to make sense of the world around us. We're, we're doing our best to live for God. And, and, and yet we know that within ourselves, that, that we just are, are dealing with this incredible struggle this, the great controversy, if you will, within our own hearts and minds and in our own lives and in our own world. And over these past several years, I, I've tried to preach and teach on the everlasting gospel of the kingdom because it's the gospel of Christ that brings hope and encouragement and strength and, and faith. And over these last few years, we've highlighted Primarily, in, in a general sense, two false gospels. A libertine gospel that, that ends up being self-focused in, in our sins, that, that because of God's grace, we don't have to, we don't have to worry about and, and we shy away from things like obedience and overcoming and holiness. And included in this libertine gospel is the popular prosperity gospel. And then on, on the very other extreme is also a very self-focused false gospel, and that is the gospel of legalism, where salvation becomes all about us and what we do and what we don't do. And the problem with these false gospels is that they compete with Christ's true gospel. Satan's agenda from the beginning has been to misrepresent God and to bring a distorted view of God. And so we've really tried to focus a lot on, on the, the view of God that, that is truly biblical, 
truly Christ-centered. We've looked at God's covenant with literal Israel in the Old Testament. We, we've talked at length about how God interacted with His people throughout the Old Testament and how ultimately through Christ He established a new covenant with the New Testament church, the spiritual Israel. And we've talked over time about all these differing views of God and how, unfortunately, most Christians today still have a view of God that's imperialistic. And last January, we did a series on the vindication of love about the cosmic conflict and how is it that if God is all-powerful and God indeed is a God of love, how is it that our world is so full of evil? How do we explain that? How do we make sense of that? And this, this cosmic conflict sets the stage for us to understand the end of all things. It's this cosmic battle that began with Lucifer in heaven against God, that, that the story begins and then the earth is created and mankind falls and, and we, we understand that, that it, the story didn't just begin here on planet earth. And so our studies over these last few years have, I believe, created a, a foundation, a, a framework uh, for considering end time thinking. For, for beginning to explore uh, Bible prophecy. You see, the, the problem with so much of what I hear today, um, and you hear a lot. I mean, uh, people are forwarding things to me all the time, links to this, and certain guys that are predicting this or that or the other thing. And the problem is that the approach is backward. People are looking at current events, and then going to the Bible. And that's a problem because what ends up happening is, is all these people with these different ideas are, are confusing the different types of Bible prophecy. They're mixing things that shouldn't be uh, connected together in an effort to, to put a puzzle piece together of, of current events and what's happening. And, and to explain it as if the Bible prophecies were written for only our generation today. But that's not the case. And so our, our end time thinking sermon series, uh, and today is installment number six. This will be our, our final uh, sermon in this series. But in this series, we've, we've uh, explored key biblical uh, characters. We've uh, looked at key turning points in, in earth's history. And so from Genesis to Revelation, what did these, what did these Bible characters, what did they, in these different generations, how, how did they view the end? How did they understand the end? And so this, this narrative from Genesis to Revelation, and today we come in the New Testament, you know, past uh, Jesus' end time sermon, past what Paul and the other apostles have written in the New Testament about the end, and they give us a little bit more than what Jesus gave us in his end time sermon. And now we come to the, to the climax, the book of Revelation. And, and so this, this Genesis to Revelation view, it, we stand, we, we basically are on a vista whereby we can see this, this macro view of, of God's actions throughout time. And we come to Revelation, the climax of the story, the end of the story. And there's great, there's great interest in, in the world today about the book of Revelation. And as we have intensifying world crisis, there, you know, there's people sense that this, that this, Last book of the Bible addresses unfolding events here on planet Earth. And, and that's partially why there's so many different interpretations and viewpoints and ideas of what Revelation means and how Revelation should be interpreted. Now, today, our purpose is not to begin interpreting Revelation. Uh, we're going to begin looking at Bible prophecy, uh, we're going to look at the different types of Bible prophecy. We're going to be looking at the apocalyptic prophecies specifically in Daniel and Revelation moving forward. So in the, in the weeks and, and months to come, we're going to begin by going to the Bible, not the headlines. You see, the Bible, when properly understood, the prophecies will tell us what the headlines will be. We don't want to make the mistake that far too many Christians are making today of looking at the headlines and then going to the Bible and trying to piece it together. 
We need to put the Bible as our foundation and our framework for understanding what's happening in the world. And when properly understood, we can know what the headlines will be in the future. And so that will be coming in the coming weeks. But today, our purpose is to look at the original setting, the, the context in which Revelation was given to John, uh, who it was written by, who it was sent to, uh, who was, why was it even written. And so this is what we'll explore today to kind of finish off this end time thinking and then create this foundation from which we will begin to build on going into the future of, of, of our sermon and teachings uh, throughout this year. Now, the literal meaning of revelation. Uh, the Greek word actually means to take the cover off, uh, to take the veil away, uh, to reveal then, in other words. So it, it means the opposite of, of hidden or secret. And Jesus even declares a blessing to those who read, listen, and obey the words of Revelation. Notice, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. And he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says. For the time is near. The very first words of Revelation tell us that, that God is revealing through Jesus Christ. And, and notice as Jesus begins to identify himself in verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. The Almighty One. So, so Revelation then is the uncovering uh, and the revealing of, of the glory of Christ and all that He has been. The revelation of, of all that He is. The uncovering and the revealing of all that He will be forevermore. And church, this, this is where we can find uh, great hope and peace. Uh, Revelation is designed to be uh, Christocentric. In other words, it's all about, it's more about Christ than it is beasts and confusing images. And yet somehow many Christians focus on not seeing Christ in Revelation. And as a result, Revelation can be a bit intimidating. It can be um, challenging. It, it can be scary even. So church, we may not know every detail of how things are going to go. We, we may not understand uh, every possible scenario of how things are going to work out in the, in, in the years ahead. But we do know that God has revealed enough through John in this book of Revelation to bring hope and salvation to all humanity. The author of this book simply identifies himself as John. And uh, he was writing to the Christians in the Roman province of Asia, Asia, providing practical counsel to the problems that they were facing. And he speaks to them as a fellow partner and brother. Notice, I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. So the evidence suggests that the author of Revelation is the apostle John the son of Zebedee, uh, the writer of the fourth gospel and the three epistles. And John wrote his revelation on Patmos, a small rocky island in the Aegean Sea. This little island served as a labor camp where Romans sent offenders to work in a labor camp. Kind of like um, an ancient Alcatraz, if you will. You, you could picture the, the small rocky island of Alcatraz as, as maybe something that John was on, an island uh, like that. And Christian tradition tells us and affirms that John's effective witnessing for the gospel and for Christ is what led the governing officials to exile him. And uh, he was exiled to this island uh, during the reign of the Roman emperor Domitian, who ruled from AD 81 to AD 96. 
And it was while on this Isle of Patmos that John received these visions of revelation from Jesus. Revelation 1, beginning in verse 10. It was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the Spirit. And suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. The letter was written and sent because the Christians in Asia, they, they were troubled by an increasing number of problems. And these problems... Some were coming from outside the church, but there were also uh, some problems inside the church. And, and this was written, this letter was written at a time when the Christians were experiencing hardship and, and pressure uh, for their refusal uh, to comply with the popular demands of emperor wor worship. And so, in this original setting, the book of Revelation, it, it's suited and designed to give comfort and hope to the oppressed, uh, to give strength to the downtrodden who are facing frightening circumstances. And uh, certainly it was John's intent to prepare them for future crises that would be coming. Now, Revelation initially, of course, no, no doubt, was uh, intended primarily for these seven Christian communities that were listed there. And now keep in mind that these groups had existed for a considerable time. Uh, by the end of the first century, uh, these uh, church communities uh, would have been second and third generation communities, not first generation. And John, the Apostle John, resided in Ephesus, and apparently he was overseeing the churches. Um, it's likely that he would visit from time to time these different churches, and, and he would help them with their needs, and he would offer encouragement and support. And toward the end of this first century, the situation in these churches really had come to spiritual decline. They were now second and third generation churches, spiritual decline had come in, and even in some cases, apostasy. Now, the church faced a number of external problems. Problem number one, the Christians in Asia faced pagan opposition and accusations because they did not participate in social activities. In other words, the Christians avoided the celebrations that were characterized by immoral practices and eating food dedicated uh, to pagan gods. And as a result, they began to lose their legal status in society. And that brought pressure to bear on the people. Problem number two. A serious threat to the churches was the development of imperial cult of worship to the emperor which brought persecution for failure to comply. What's interesting is that the Christians were considered atheists by the Romans because they would not worship the emperor. Therefore, they were viewed as atheists. And this created an insecure situation in the churches. And John expected this to intensify over time. The persecution would increase for the believers, and the believers were fearful. They, they were fearful about what the future would bring. And problem number three, Christianity, which began as an offshoot of Judaism, and the churches were suffering uh, due to conflicts with the Jews. So these two religions had worked kind of somewhat side by side, but there was increased conflict between the Christians and the Jews. Now, in the book of Acts, it depicts a shift in the early church from continuity in relationship toward separation between the two religions. The separation was hastened by the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So after the war in AD 70, the Christians were not welcomed in the synagogue. Uh, they were not welcomed because they refused to join in the war against the Romans. And right after the destruction of Jerusalem, the Jews added an 18th benediction to the 17 benedictions that they recited each week at the closing of services at the synagogue. 
In reality, this, this 18th benediction was not really a benediction at all. Rather, it was a curse against Christ and Christians. And evidently, the Christians refused to recite this 18th benediction, and thus they were eventually expelled from the synagogue. So you might say that at the end of the first century, the relationship between the Jews and the Christians would have been characterized uh, with the words antagonism and, and much hostility. And, and not only were these seven churches challenged by these external problems that were on them and pressures, but there were several internal problems as well. They were seriously divided on certain issues. Some of the churches, the majority of the members were, were faithful. And, and some individuals, including some church leaders, were not faithful. And they opposed the Apostle John and his leadership. There were other churches like Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia where actually the majority of the believers were in apostasy. And then you come to the church of Laodicea where it appears that the whole church seems to be in apostasy because there's nothing good to be found in her. So from the standpoint of a leader, a pastoral leader, John is obviously not, not much appreciated in many of these churches. And the basic issues that the Christians were wrestling with involved uh, the lifestyle of eating food offered to idols and sexual immorality. Now, these two things were things that uh, the council in Jerusalem had instructed Christians to stay away from. And these issues threatened the unity of the churches. The popular demands of society, uh, there were certain expectation, uh, expectations that were put on all citizens. In other words, you, you were expected to participate in these religious festivals and, and, uh, that, it, that took place at the pagan temples. And quite frankly, if you refused, you suffered ridicule, um, you suffered social isolation, uh, you were kind of fringe, you know, on the fringe of society. Uh, you might even suffer economic sanctions. And so often these festivals ended in drunkenness and immoral activities, including temple prostitution. And temple prostitution was done with the idea of supposedly increasing the fertility of the land and increasing the overall prosperity of society. So anyone desiring economic status, anyone desiring political status, anyone desiring social status, they were expected, they were required to meet these religious demands. And this created a huge problem for the Christians because this is a significant compromise to Christian beliefs and moral values. And so the, the churches were divided on these issues. Should we participate or not participate? Some decisively said no. However, there were others that advocated a compromise. And these opponents to John were referred to by different names. The Nicolaitans the Nicolaitans, the Balaamites, the prominent and influential woman Jezebel. Now, scholars are divided with this, this, this prominent and influential woman of Jezebel. Uh, some believe that there actually was a woman named Jezebel in the church. Some believe that it refers to the spirit of Jezebel uh, from the Old Testament, and that this kind of evil and thinking and immorality uh, was being promoted in the church there. So all three of these groups were advocating compromise. Um, some of them attempted to find theological justification in the writings of Paul. And, uh, you know, they, they, if you think about Paul, who was Paul? Paul was the great evangelist to the Gentiles. So, so Paul is out there meeting with people in society. He's rubbing shoulders with them. He's trying to build relationships with them. He's trying to find common ground upon which he can influence them for the gospel of Christ. And, and in Romans 13 in 1 Timothy 2, uh, Paul argues, he strongly encourages subjugation to governing authorities. And we also know from Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans 14 that for him, feasting in pagan festivals was not an issue because idols are nothing. 
And so, while we know that Paul had those views and he was coming at it from the side of, of an evangelist, which, by the way, these two uh, thought processes and points of emphasis exist even in our church today. You know, there are some that focus on the evangelistic side and rubbing shoulders with people and not withdrawing from society, engaging as salt and light and striking that balance. And yet there's others that advocate, listen, we've got to be careful not to let worldly thinking and pagan thinking come into the church. So in seeming contrast to Paul, John makes the argument against compromise. And while he admits that idols are nothing to participate in pagan festivals, in his mind compromise the Christian faith and might even honor Satan himself. And in light of the soon coming of Christ, Christians ought to be on the right side. You see, John thought that, the, that Christ was coming the second time soon in their generation. He thought it was happening. And so there was a sense of urgency for him that we not compromise. So for the sake of being faithful to Christ and to his gospel, we must, if necessary, withdraw from the world. We must sacrifice our social and business prosperity. And so... John and Paul, while they came at it from a different point, we know that Paul would never advocate compromise of Christian beliefs, Christian values, or morals. And so we have the same struggle today in our church. We feel it. The balance between being in the world and not of the world. The balance of being engaged in our community and and keeping enough distance so that the world isn't in us. And that's an ongoing challenge. It was for the churches in John's day, and it's been ever since, all the way down to our day. So all of that to simply say that the primary purpose of John's writing Revelation initially was to help the first century Christians in Asia with their spiritual condition and their problems. To summarize, the churches were confronted with growing hostility from Rome, invading heresy, and increasing apostasy. They were concerned about their identity and their very existence. That was the context of John's revelation that he received on the small rocky island of Patmos. That's the setting in which the seven churches of Asia existed. And these seven churches were who John was writing to. This is John's understanding of the context of the end. John understood the end was coming. He understood that all that he was seeing that he wrote about in the book of Revelation was important. There were some things he couldn't write. But this... This is the context from which he understood the end of all things. And it it was impossible for John or any other Bible writer to know that our generation would exist today, 2,000 years later, and still be waiting for the second coming. And so we're going to learn in the coming weeks and months that, that God designed the book of Revelation to be relevant and applicable, not only to John's generation, but to every, every generation since, including our generation. And so in this end time thinking sermon series, we've clearly established that no member of the human family will know the date or the hour of the second coming. We also additionally, and I want to summarize and review them today, we established five principles and one pattern of how God works. And so let's review our, 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 our principles and pattern that we discovered uh, as we review and close. Principle number one, God reveals himself to each generation just in time. God doesn't show up early. God doesn't show up late. God shows up right on time. And whenever God was about to do something significant, God would reveal himself at just the right time. 
And he would raise up the proclaimers so that they could proclaim what God wanted them to say, to get the attention of the people, to prepare the people for what was coming. Church, this is a pattern that has repeated all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And in these last days, God is not going to change how he works. God will cont continue to reveal himself in our generation, just in time, so that we can cooperate with God, adjust our lives to him, and walk in obedience and be prepared for the crisis that lies ahead. Principle number two, when God seeks to communicate something about the future, he draws on the language, culture, and experience of the writers to communicate his message effectively. In other words, he meets people where they are. Principle number three, in each case, God used the language of the past as a tool to communicate his present will and or his plan for the future. So, you know, we, we've seen this repetition and enlargement that, that there was this ever unfolding understanding of the end. And God built on what had happened in the past. He used the language of the past to present what's happening today and what will happen in the future. So it's important to understand the language of the past. It's, under, it's important to understand the history. Principle number four. When God revealed his plan for the future to those who would proclaim the message, they knew it was God speaking. They, they didn't have to wonder or question whether it was God that had spoken to them. They clearly knew. And further, principle number five, God reve uh, revealed details that were specific enough so that these prophets could know God's will regarding the future. And it provided clear instructions so that they could adjust their lives to God's will. In other words, they could adjust their life and they would do what God had asked them to do in the way that God had asked them to do it, proclaiming what God had asked them to proclaim. We also discovered a pattern that throughout history, and we, we see this with Noah and the flood, that there was a decline in humanity. Uh, morality uh, would decline, things would get more and more evil, and God would then proclaim. And as God proclaimed, he was proclaiming to get the attention of people, mankind, so that they would turn back to him. And over time, when man refuses, God's cup gets full. In other words, there's only so much, only so far that God will allow rebellion to go. And then in the Old Testament, we see the beginning of this, this series of redemptive judgments that God brings. And ultimately, in some cases, punitive judgment where cities are destroyed. In the example of the flood, the whole world was destroyed, except for Noah's family that got in the ark with him. So you have this, this progression, decline, proclamation, judgment, and then whatever the end result is from those judgments. So, for these churches in Asia, these seven churches, they were wondering, what will the future bring? That was their question. And the book of Revelation was intended to provide the answer, and John sent that in written form to these churches. Now, keep in mind in those days that the copies of, of this had to be uh, produced by hand. And down through the ages until the printing press was, was uh, invented, um, you know, it was very difficult to, to permeate the, the letters of Scripture. It was time-consuming. So all the symbols and different things in the book of Revelation allowed God to say the maximum amount with the fewest amount of words. And we'll begin unpacking that in the near future. But you know that, that question, the, the question that the seven churches were asking, uh, what, what will the future bring? That's the exact same question we find ourselves asking today. It's the same question. 2,000 years later, we're asking the same question. And Revelation declares that although the world is, is threatening and hostile to God's people, 
when the future may appear gloomy. God in Christ is still the master of history. The story from Genesis to Revelation is that God has always been with his people. That God is presently with his people. And that throughout eternity, God will always be with his people. Revelation is the end of the story. Revelation is the good news. The final vindication of love. God will vindicate his people. There will be this grand and glorious eschatological climax. The eschaton. All will be done, all will be settled, and ultimately sin will be destroyed. The Bible writers in both the Old Testament and the New looked forward in their generation to the end of all things. And through the generations, God has continued to reveal more and more. The, the understanding of the end has been evolving throughout the generations to our current understanding today. And each generation looked forward as we in our generation look forward to the establishment of God's eternal kingdom, a kingdom based solely on love with no more sin, no more sorrow, no more pain, and no more death. Church, if you've been in the church for a long time or you grew up in the church, you've heard preachers preach that in the end there's going to be two groups of people. I've preached it. And we'll refer to two groups of people, the saints and the sinners, the sheep and the goats. Uh, in the language of Revelation, uh, those who have the seal of God and those who take the mark of the beast. Uh, those that are going to be inside the New Jerusalem and those that are going to be outside the city. But I'd like you to consider this morning the ultimate description of these two groups of people. There will be those who love and there will be those who hate. Some in the church will love. But we know that there will be some in the church that will hate. And the reality is that some outside the church will love. And some outside the church will also hate. The ultimate description, the two groups, those who love those who hate. So I close this morning with the words from 1 Corinthians 13. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way, it is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. But love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. 
And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when full understanding comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, as in a cloudy mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the revealing of your Son, Jesus. All that Jesus is, was, and ever will be, his glory. Lord, he's coming soon. We know that. In the clouds of heaven, for the second time, we cannot wait. He will come as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And Lord, I pray for all who are listening this morning that we would find hope and encouragement and faith, strength in Jesus as we think about the world in which we live, as we think about just the craziness of what's happening around us. And Lord, we, we know there's some things that are going to happen between now and when you come. And Lord, our desire is to be in the center of your will. Lord, help us not to run ahead of you in our thinking about the end time, but help us also not to lag behind. Lord, give us the, the appropriate sense of urgency that we need. May each one of us turn to Jesus and trust Jesus more than the headlines or the politicians or anything else in this world. God help us as we go forward. I pray a blessing on your church as we go into a new week. Lord, um, the challenges will be many, but the joys will be there as well and the blessings. So God, we thank you in advance for going with us, for being with us, and we look forward to that eternal kingdom that you will put us into one day in this world of sin and sorrow will cease. To you be the glory forever and ever is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.